news to report for all Christians. The Ole Miss Rebels made the College World Series. So I knew all good Christian people would be happy about that. Last team in. Uh, haven't lost a game yet, so we're headed back to the World Series. But anyway, in other news, <coughs> prayer. And if you're an Ole Miss fan in sports, prayer is a regular part of your routine. Uh, so as we think about worshiping in prayer this morning, we spent some time looking at uh, just the passages that help us with the corporate nature of prayer and worship. Uh, we looked in Matthew and then Acts. Uh, obviously, we're going to have more of them when we see church history unfold. Um, then we looked at uh, Miss Debbie done straightened out my PowerPoint for me. It was off this morning. She's got it in order now. First Corinthians one or First Corinthians fourteen about prayer in the public assembly and the church echoing the amen as they pray along with the one who speaks in which they can understand. And then the idea of being spoken to prayer leaders, the idea of a public assembly, so that's worship in that public assembly. Then we spent some time talking about the past uh, to kind of see how people throughout, uh, especially in this context, the first four centuries have dealt with this and, and how they viewed worship uh, in prayer and how it could be best executed. And, you know... Um, to me, that's just a sense of you're kind of dialoguing with people. Uh, pe one of the things I love about reading is it allows me to have conversations with people who have long been dead uh, because I can read their thoughts and kind of think through. And so um, books to me are like conversational companions. I can talk with people throughout the centuries and kind of see what they thought and how they handled certain situations. And so one of the things we saw in that is the Jewish custom of the hours of prayer and how that became a pretty important role in early Christian thought and practice. They would have their hours of prayer. And again, when we say hours of prayer, we don't mean they sat and prayed for an hour. We mean a time when they came together uh, in order to pray together in, in a more public sense. Then we talked about the centrality of the Lord's Prayer and uh, how it was so important to them. And by the way, that, that continues on throughout church history. Um, many of the reformers, <clears throat> they uh, structured their prayers after the Lord's Prayer. Um, Martin Luther, John Calvin, some of those guys. Now again, obviously I would have some very fundamental disagreements with them about a lot of things. But uh, that doesn't mean that every bit of their studies should be null and void and pushed to the side. And, they spoke a lot about using the Lord's Prayer kind of as like this model or this launching pad and it was kind of the grid by which they prayed and uh, we'll talk actually more about that here in just a little bit then uh, we looked at some of the conclusive evidence we talked about how the Psalms were then added of course the Psalms were obviously sung as a part of worship from the very beginning it's the song book not only of Israel but the church in its very beginning uh, as a matter of fact when uh, Paul writes Ephesians he says speaking to one another in psalms. That's the psalms. Uh, they were originally meant to be sung. But they were also, uh, as the second century and on into the third century, they were brought into the worship service not just to be sung, but also to help people pray uh, in that process. And the psalms are very good even today when we're learning about prayer in general, private prayer uh, on most of those occasions. But some of those psalms also can show us some things about public prayer uh, if you'll look in, depending upon what version you use, if you use an older version um, like King James, it'll be called a psalm of degree. They're all grouped together in the 100s, um, about 121 to 133 or 34, something like that. You'll see in the heading those are psalms of degree, or in more modern translations they will say songs of ascent. And what that means is these were the songs they would sing on their way to worship at the temple. Ascent or degree means journey or elevation to a higher place, and the Temple Mount was the highest place. And so these were songs that they would sing or prayers that they would pray as they made their ascent up to worship. And so there are some things in those psalms that help us uh, also in our public worship. And one of the big things we wanted to emphasize is the liberty of execution here. Okay? Um, <clears throat> and that comes at so many different forms that... Uh, some of this, like it or not, is cultural. Um, that, that kind of goes down to the question of, should a prayer be long or should it be short? Yes. Yes. 
if a person, you know, I've, I've heard people be critical on both sides. I've, I've actually heard a number of preachers say that if a person is leading a long public prayer, they need to catch up on their prayer life at home. And I think that's just absolutely an unfair assessment of, of someone praying. Um, at the same time, someone's prayer can be just as effective as a short prayer. You see short prayers in the Bible. You see long prayers in the Bible. So there's liberty there. And I don't think we need to get into the game of sometimes you wonder when you hear people talk about these things, you kind of wonder if they ever actually pray along with the person who is praying or if they're too busy analyzing how and what they're saying. In which it's kind of ironic then because they're criticizing him for how he worships and leads people in worship and they're refusing to worship as they criticize. So there's liberty here and we need to be careful about it, okay? Now, <clears throat> let's talk about some principles, and there are just two of them. Well, we looked at the proof here, uh, which is where we walked through the early church practice again, the command to leaders, and then how the Lord's Prayer is structured showed us that prayer is an act of worship. It shows our dependence upon God. It shines a light upon Him that He is glorified and magnified. So tonight I want us to look at just two principles. Um, we'll begin with the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, and then we will look at an acronym and hopefully... Uh, that will be the end of our study. So let's begin in Matthew chapter 6, again, reading the Lord's Prayer. Let's read it and put it in front of us one more time in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus says this in verse 9. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So I want to give three ideas here first that we can think from the Lord's Prayer. And there, are, there have been volumes of books written on the Lord's Prayer alone and an analysis of it. So there are tons of things that could be said. I simply want to give three. The first of which is <clears throat> that we begin with God and we move to us. Okay? So, notice how the prayer begins. It's focused solely upon God in the beginning. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then it moves to us as those who are offering the prayer, give us this day our daily bread, so forth. The petitions move toward us. And I think there's something really important about that. Now, again, there's no law. And I'm often scared to... Um, talk about this subject in particular because some people kind of get the notion of they, they kind of get nervous and say well is he listening and judging my prayer well first of all if I'm doing that I'm sinning but second of all it doesn't matter if I judge your prayer what matters is that God judges it correctly okay but no I, I don't sit and when I hear a person praying I don't sit and analyze how they're praying that's not worshiping I'm praying with them Whatever it is that they're saying. So I don't want it to be, people to get the idea that somehow I'm sitting here and I'm kind of analyzing someone's prayer as they go along. That's not, I'm not God. All I'm simply offering here are things that I see in the text that I think are useful. It doesn't mean that they have to be executed this way. There's liberty in this, okay? So I want to make that emphatic on the very front end. But one of the things I do see, and it's not just in the Lord's Prayer, but it's also in a number of other prayers, is that they begin with an emphasis and a focus upon praise to God. And one of the reasons, there's good reason why many of them do that, and it's because it kind of, one writer described it as it kind of clears the fog and reminds us who we're talking to. So when you begin talking to God and you begin focusing, say, on an attribute of God, which we'll see in just a minute, it begins by the focus saying, this is God. To remind myself, I'm talking to God, number one. And I want the things of God to be up there at the highest priority. And so when I go ahead and remind myself, I praise God for who He is and His greatness and His glory, that helps me throughout the rest of my prayer. When I come to make requests, I'm reminded that this is the God who, in the words of Job, I know you can do anything. And so when I start reminding myself, or even as a congregation when we're praying, we're reminding ourselves that this is someone we're talking to. Yes, he's a friend, he's a father, 
but he's also not our buddy down the street. This is someone who is wholly different than we are. And that helps us when we come to later requests, as we said, because we start to remember, hey, I'm dealing with someone who is far more powerful and can handle a lot more than uh, sometimes I think or want to give him my problems. And so I, in essence, it goes like this. When you make, when you realize and remind yourself how big God is, your problems look small that you're talking to him about in comparison. And that's a good thing. Furthermore, <clears throat> sometimes prayer, now some people, I, I would have struggled to understand this principle probably 10 years ago because I didn't understand prayer correctly. But if someone views prayer as a need line, like this is just something we do, we go to God and we tell him what we need and when we expect him kind of like a candy machine to spit out what it is we've asked for. What I'm about to say won't make much sense if that's the way I view prayer. Prayer primarily is about communion with God. That's what it's about. And there is in prayer a reorienting process by which I can actually I bring my will into line with God's will through prayer perfect example is Jesus in the garden he goes to the father and what is Jesus's desire in that moment it's not to die but as he prays to God and we don't know everything that they said that he said in that prayer we have a few snippets but as he prays to God, he comes around and he aligns his will to the will of the Father and says what? Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Prayer, again, when you focus on God first, it makes you realize and remember who you're talking to and it helps you. I may not want to do something, but it reminds me that I need to align my will with God's. And so focusing at, with God, on God at the beginning, and then moving to myself, I think has a lot of benefits, and I think it has a lot of biblical precedent. Number two, <clears throat> that when you read this prayer, notice there are more requests that are spiritual in nature than there are physical. As a matter of fact, the only physical request that I can see in the prayer is give us this day our daily bread. That's the only physical request I can see in it. Everything else is spiritual in nature. And in preparation for this, I'm j I just went through the way I'd start a number of things topically, and I just took my notepad and started looking at text. And one of the things I looked at in categorizing some of these things is what was it that they prayed for? When we see prayer mentioned in the New Testament, what things are connected to it? And I've got to tell you, Praying for physical things might register as a 2% on the scale. It's more of help a person stand under persecution. Let the word of God have free course. I want, as we talked about last Sunday night, the prayer of Paul in Ephesians 3, help them to know the love of Christ. Or his prayer in Ephesians 1. Um, that they would know the power of Christ that's at work within them. And I don't know if it's because as, I'm not certain as to why, because listen, I'm saying this to myself. If I'm honest with you, if I sat down and categorized my prayers, I know physical requests outweigh spiritual requests for me. I know it's a problem. And so I'm not saying, coming to you saying I've got this figured out. But when I look at the New Testament, a lot of these requests are more spiritually driven. We, we talk about God wanting to you know, bless us and help our health to prosper. And listen, there's nothing wrong with praying that, certainly. We'll get to that with intercessions. But, you know, I worry sometimes that our prayers, even in public, are 
You know, we pray for the physical conditions of people, but we don't spend very much time praying for spiritual conditions of people. Those who are spiritually weak, those who are marginal in their commitment, those who are lacking in their love of Jesus. We don't often pray for help us to see Jesus more clearly, help us to understand and to comprehend more and more every day, to fathom, to fathom the depths of his love for us. Help us to grow in our inner being. We know our body is only temporary. We're concerned about that in certain ways, but we're most concerned that you take care of our souls, that our souls are healthy. You know, <clears throat> if, if we were honest, even in private prayer, a lot of times we spend a lot more time worrying about and praying to God about our children's physical safety and health than we do their spiritual safety and health. There's this orientation, though, when you look at the New Testament that it's just the opposite. And I don't know if that is because we have become so far advanced in medicine and we expect life to last so much longer now as opposed to then, you know, the average lifespan in Palestine at that time was about 45 years old. And it was just an accepted part of life and they knew it. I don't, I'm not really sure what the answer to it is. But a focus on the spiritual side of the content of our request, I think, is, is something we need to keep in mind. Um, because spiritually speaking, you know, I know a lot of churches that if you looked at their physical health of the people who were there, they're, real, they're pretty healthy people. They might be on some medicines, but they're pretty healthy people. But their spiritual health, they would be an ICU. God doesn't care if I can run 37 miles nonstop. If my soul is on life support. That's why in 3 John, you remember, he prayed that, you're, that you may be in health and prosper. Your health would prosper as your soul prospers. And so the content of our prayers need to be focused in a lot, I think, on the more spiritual side. Number three, the Lord's Prayer as a template. And uh, as we said this morning, you know, in the early parts of the church, they would pray the prayer over and over. We, sent, we tend to view it more as a template. You know, both are acceptable approaches to dealing with it. But when we say use it as a template, what do we mean? Okay. So when you look at it and just analyze <clears throat> the uh, words of the prayer, it begins in what we call a paternal nature, our Father. It moves to praise, hallowed be your name. It moves to submission and the reign and the will of God. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It comes to God providing for us, give us this day our daily bread. It comes to talk about pardon, the forgiveness of sins. Forgive us our sins as we have forgiven others. It comes with spiritual temptation and pressures. So... <clears throat> I may use that as a model. I may not utter a single word that Jesus actually uses here, but I can use that as a grid when I'm leading the people of God to say, okay, I want to make sure that I'm praying for the things I need to be praying for as I lead the church. Well, there's an outline. I can begin my prayer <clears throat> focusing on God, Moving to, when he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that might be a time to insert things about the church. The health of the church, the love of the church, the growth of the church, all of those things, insert them right there. Uh, um, when you look at the physical needs, it could be, you know, help us to provide for those who are in need, to find them, open doors of opportunity for us to see them. Um, then you move into forgiveness. Surely, as we come together and pray, we need to be penitent people. Help us as we face temptations throughout the week. 
Who doesn't face a temptation throughout the week at work? I do, and I'd sit in an office by myself. So I'm going to say it's probably pretty safe to say you do too. And so it, it kind of becomes a working template about which you pray or a grid. And I can think, you know, I've, I've covered some things there that I think are acceptable before God and make sure that I've covered the things that I think he thinks are important. So that's principle one when we look at the Lord's Prayer. The next is just an acronym called ACTS. And this is tracing it down in church history to see where it originated is about like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Okay? Don't know exactly who developed the acronym. But it has been a proven useful tool. Uh, and so each one of these letters stands for a different type of prayer. Now you remember that there are many different types of prayer throughout Scripture. And um, <clears throat> there is discussion about these things. So some people take two philosophies with this. Some people say we should pray one big prayer that combines all of these. Which I would say in 21st century American churches, that's probably what you're going to find the most of where a person leads a prayer and they're going to encompass all of these things. And that's perfectly acceptable. Perfectly pleasing to God. Others will kind of take an approach that says we should actually have four different prayers in public and each one focusing on one of these things alone. And that's perfectly acceptable and profitable as well. It's simply a matter of, <clears throat> of preference, really. Uh, what do you think works the best? I think there are benefits to doing both of them. Um, you know, if I'm just being honest, I like worship services that change things up. Um, when Wendell Winkler preached in Texas, he said, we kept everybody guessing. They didn't know if the Lord's Supper was first or the sermon was first. No service was ever the same. Not in its order. Refused to do it. No announcements. He said, I might get up and start preaching first thing. Keeps us awake and aware. Keeps us from going to sleep. So, <clears throat> there are multiple ways to go about this is the point. Now, the first of these types of prayers, the letter A, is called the prayer of adoration. And these are prayers where we praise God. Okay? Where we simply praise God. <clears throat> and as a matter of fact, uh, um, these prayers as well are also very beneficial in your private prayer life. Um, as a matter of fact, I think in your private prayer life, they're very beneficial to take them one at a time and to offer four distinctive prayers throughout the day. I think they're very beneficial in that way. But <clears throat> prayers of adoration are where you praise God. And when you look at Psalms 146 through 150, those are called the Hallelujah Psalms because they begin and end with praise the Lord. There's an emphasis upon praising God for who He is and for His nature. So, in a prayer of adoration, we praise God for two things, primarily. For who He is and what He has done. When you look at Revelation 4 and 5, the worship of the Father and the Son, that's the emphasis. They praise God for who He is, Revelation 4 and verse 8, holy, holy, holy. And they praise God for what He has done, Revelation 5 and verse 11. You created all things, or 4 and verse 11, and then in worshiping Jesus in chapter 5, verses um, 9 through 12, they praise Him for His work in redemption. So you praise God for who He is and also for what He has done. And so, <clears throat> for an example, we might say, pick a specific attribute of God. So if, if I'm leading a public prayer and I want to begin with praise, you know, God has multiple attributes. And um, as one writer put it, when you try to pray for everything, you end up praying for nothing. Right? you got to pick and choose. There's so much. You don't have to get it all in one. And so if we begin by saying, okay, today when I lead this prayer, I want to begin, I want to think about whether, and listen, this is all between you and figuring this out and how you want to pray. Other people may not know it. But as the leader, I want to know what's going on. And so I'm going to look at God's holiness. I'm going to praise Him for His holiness in this. 
And so I'll begin by talking to God and praising Him for His holiness and His separateness. Or in other places like Revelation 19, they praise Him for His wrath. So I begin by looking at those attributes and praising Him for who He is. And also for what He has done to redeem me. What He has done in creation. To bring us into existence as a father, as he cares for us. And so it begins with adoration. With a focus upon praise for God. And then number two, it moves to confession. Now again, this is a suggested outline and an acronym. So part of the reason why they put it in this order is you don't want to spell at sus. I mean, you mess up the order, right? This is, this is a, a mnemonic device. So nobody's saying it has to be this way. This is just kind of an idea. But confession is actually quite logically the next step. Because when you look at like Isaiah 6 and Luke 5 and Revelation 1, where people encounter the glorified Christ, the first thing that they ever mention or recognize is their sinfulness. So when you see God for who He is and His holiness, you're immediately reflecting upon yourself and you see yourself for who you are in your sinfulness like Isaiah when he saw the image of Jesus on the throne and he says woe is me for I'm undone I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips why do I feel this way because my eyes have seen the king and so I confess it's a it's a natural response to seeing God in His holiness is to confess my sinfulness. And so <clears throat> the confession of our sins uh, becomes basically a logical next step, and that's why it's placed where it is. Now, here are some things that praying and confessing our sins will do for us as a church, and that's why it's so important in the public assembly to do this. The first thing it should do is make us glad because we have a God who's willing to forgive us. When a person is standing, leading us in public prayer, and it says, ask God to forgive us of our sins, that shouldn't be some empty phrase that we just expect in a prayer. You know, <clears throat> some people, they talk about worship and they say, it's just so boring. My answer is, then that means you're not doing anything. You're not actually worshiping. Worship is not a spectator sport. Do you know, it is incredibly hard to pray along and to be focused on every word that someone is saying and to be reminded that I'm kneeling before God as I do this. It's incredibly hard to sing a song and to understand the theology of the song and the message of the song and to sing it with my heart, focused on God. It's incredibly hard. People, people act like sometimes listening to a sermon should be easy. It's not. Especially in our culture, it's not easy to listen to a sermon. That's why it's called a spiritual discipline. You discipline yourself. Even though your mind wants to wander, you force it back in line. And so when you're done with worship, you should be tired. Your brain should be very tired. Because you've been focusing it and channeling it and trying to keep every distraction out and focusing solely upon what's going on. And so when a person prays for this and they offer that confession, it makes us glad because we remember that we have forgiveness. But it should also remind us that the forgiveness that we have is something that we want to share with other people. It should make us evangelistic in a way. Further, it should make us extremely gracious. I don't know that I've heard a prayer really in my life in an assembly where we didn't seek God's forgiveness. But part of me knows that we're not fully understanding that because of the way we refuse to forgive other people. Forgiven people forgive people 
It's the only response. And if we're not gracious, it's because we're not understanding something about how we've been forgiven. Something is disconnected there in that understanding. But further, it keeps us grounded. It keeps us from having a head that kind of gets big and we can float off into la-la land. We should never get to the point where, you know what, you know, I'm not really a sinful person. I'm really not that bad of a guy. Actually, the gospel, part of the gospel message is that you are actually worse than you think you are. I am worse than I would like to think I am. The things of which you and I are capable would scare us if we sat down and really acknowledged them. But the gospel is not only that you're worse off than you think you are. You're more loved than you ever dreamed you could be by the one who knows your sinfulness. And your sins and your struggle with sin and your confession of your sins keeps you grounded in reality. That I can't look at you and say, you know what? <clears throat> I can't believe you're struggling with that because my sin over here is, is this. It's not that big a deal. When we start getting into that judgmentalism of other people's sins, we forget our own. That's why confession is so important because it keeps us grounded and keeps us from looking at things in a disproportionate way. And so confession becomes extremely important as we come together as a community. That's why confessing sins cannot be overlooked. Then <clears throat> there is the prayer of thanksgiving. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1, you have a number of different types of prayers there. Thanksgiving, intercession, um, supplication, so forth. But giving of thanks uh, is the way it is worded, I believe, in the ESV, excuse me, and other translations. So thanksgiving obviously would flow after confession. You can, now again, I say this, I keep reiterating this, you can move these around any way you want to. But you know, if I've confessed my sins and God has forgiven me, the next prompt would be what? Thankfulness. So it just seems like a logical flow is why it's placed in that particular order. So, <clears throat> one person called this the specification and the personalizing of prayer. Thanksgiving is the specification and the personalizing of prayer because we're specifying things for which we are thankful. We're uniquely identifying things that God has done for us for which we are thankful. And so it becomes important. And by the way, these are physical blessings as well as spiritual blessings. One writer described this as thanksgiving, prayers of thanksgiving are called, or summarized in these words, why me? Similar to what David would say in Psalm 8, 4, when I, 8, 3 and 4, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? Do you see what he's saying? He's blown away. He looks at all this and he says, why do you pay attention to a speck of dust in the middle of all this? What did the psalmist say? I am poor and needy, but yet the Lord thinks upon me. Why me? Of all the people in the world who could be blessed, why does he bless me? You know, I had a teacher in school <clears throat> who believed very strongly. As a matter of fact, I was talking to Dad about this at lunch today. He believed very strongly in Luke 12, 47 and 48. And he says, where Jesus says, to whom much is given, much will be required. And he's told us many times in class, and I've read it in his books. <clears throat> he said, you know, to get to do what I do is a privilege. And he said, and a great portion of that privilege is because of where I was born. He said, if I were born in Haiti, where, I did, where I've done plenty of mission work, he said, my job would be to sell ice on the side of the road to try and feed my family. God has blessed me with tremendous opportunity for him to pursue his Ph.D. and to be an academic. He understands that what he does is a gift from God. 
And not many people in the history of the world have had the opportunity to do what he does. And he's thankful for it. But more than thankful for it, there is a burning drive in him. He works incredibly hard because he feels the weight of the privilege that God has laid upon him. He's thankful. And as a church, we have a zillion reasons to be thankful. And then, finally, supplication or intercession. Some people put those two together. A supplication is a special request. And an intercession is where you go to God on behalf of someone else. And so you can see how those two could very easily be intertwined, right? I might have a specific request for an individual. So it's a supplication and intercession packaged together. And so in supplications, we're making special requests. We're leaning upon God and glorifying Him. We're, one writer said we're unburdening ourselves on God, talking to Him about these things. So, if we have supplications, I think a tremendous idea, and again, an idea, would be, say, we decided that in our public prayers for the next year, we would like to beg God to spiritually mature us. We, we hammer that. We do not let it go. We keep asking him to bring us to maturity and 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 to bring us to maturity. maturity. That we hammer down on, we identify what we think our biggest need is and we hammer down on that request and beat down the door of God, so to speak, seeking an answer to that. Because James says you don't have because you don't ask. Luke 18 says, you got to be like a widow who's willing to wear a judge out to get what you're requested. So supplication is that time. And so these are some things that they have application privately, but they also have their application publicly as we pray that we can focus in on some of these things and hopefully, <clears throat> listen, it's like anything else. As we said, there's liberty in this. All we want to do in a study like this is say, let's benefit from the studies of others and see that there are other things out here and kind of broaden our minds a little bit. And, you know, if you like something, if something there really pops to you, use it. If it doesn't, it's not like it's, uh, you know, we're breaking a law or something. We're just trying to expand and grow uh, in our thinking. And, You know, there's more than one way uh, to skin a cat. And there's definitely more than one way to pray. And uh, so, as we think about praying together, we have an opportunity now for anyone who desires uh, to become a Christian. With a penitent faith, confessing Christ to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of the sins, of your sins, that's calling on the name of the Lord. You're seeking his forgiveness in that process. Or maybe as a New Testament Christian, we're struggling with sin. Maybe that's something you want to talk about, would like for all of us to pray together about. Maybe that's something you want to talk about on a private level. We've got plenty of people that want to do that for you if we can. Or maybe we're just struggling with life. God says, here's an opportunity for you to unburden yourself on me. 1 Peter 5, 7, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. He cares about what you're going through. And we do too. And so if we can help you this evening, that's what we want to do as we stand and sing this song.